Um, welcome to the Good. Um, anyway, welcome to the April 24th meeting of the Agricultural Innovation Board. Uh, we're here in Williston, and uh, we got uh, three of our members here, um, or four of our members, I guess. Um, and uh, we've got folks signed in. Um, yep. We'll let Morgan. Oh, uh, okay. Sure, yeah, uh, I can run that. Yeah, Morgan, why don't you go ahead and. Well, on, uh, well, let's go, let's go around and do introductions here first in the room. Sure. So, Roy, you want to start? Sure. Um, Roy Beckford, um, University of Vermont Extension. I'm associate dean of positive agriculture and director of extension. Uh, Steve Dwynell, director of public health agriculture resource management division. Sarah Owen, state toxicologist, health department. Jonathan Chamberlain, uh, crop control. Uh, Stephanie Smith, uh, Deputy Director within Public Health and Agricultural Resource Management Management at the Agency of Agriculture. <laughs> and Jill Sheplow Goss, uh, Feed Seeds Fertilizer Specialist with the agency. Yeah, and uh, actually, uh, Stephanie, I don't know if you, do we have a Wi-Fi that uh, folks can get on here in the room? There. Oh, is that up there on the wall? Yeah, yeah up there on the wall. Okay, sorry, never mind. Okay, we go ahead and do the introductions online. Uh, sure, we have Ryan, go ahead. Ryan Rebozo uh, from the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Wendy Sue? Wendy Sue Harper, um, I'm a soil scientist and I hold the soil biology position on the board. Um, how about Andrew? Hi, I'm Andrew Monkris, and I'm with the Vermont Beekeepers Association. And Fred? Yeah, hi, Fred. I'm Fred Putnam with the Vermont Beekeepers Association and also a soil scientist in a past life. Uh, Dave? Dave Huber, uh, Deputy Director of the Public Health and Agricultural Research Management Division with the Agency of Agriculture. Thanks, Steve. And Clark? Yep, Clark Parmelay with the Vermont Agency of Ag. I'm a Ag Resource Management Specialist. Great, and I'm Morgan Griffith. I'm with the Agency of Ag, and I'm sorry I'm not there with you in person today, but um, I think we're going to work this. So thanks for all of you who came, um, and I'm sorry to see you through a screen. Um, so I think that's all I have online. Um, but if somebody comes on, uh, we'll make sure to grab them. So uh, first, um, I sent out the meeting minutes from the end of March. Um, I didn't hear any adjustments or anything, but if anybody, does anybody have any changes that they want to make to the minutes or do we accept them as they were shared? I'll move to accept them as written. Thanks, Wendy. Okay. Um, and then we have a few just we to go over the action items from those minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about we had the action item to look into uh, some okay oh, morgan morgan yeah. before you do that um i think we should talk about uh, the, uh clara stepping off the board and amanda being appointed sure so um clara for a while uh clara air has been juggling a lot of things and so she asked to see if we could have a substitute to fill the conventional dairy spot um, for her. And so, Steve, you can talk to it, but so we um, went through and we have Amanda St. Pierre that's going to join us on the board. Um, and I know she was um, gonna come today and hopefully um, she had some 
things to attend to at the farm that came up last minute. So hopefully she'll be able to join us. Um, if not later, it looks like she's not on yet, but um, so hopefully then we'll be able to introduce ourselves to her and her to us as well. So we're welcoming Amanda and saying a very appreciative goodbye to Clara. And also, I think um, uh, Clarice Cutler has joined. Yep. Um, yep. Clarice, if you want to do a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Clarice Cutler, and I'm with Agency of Natural Resources. Thanks. Thanks, Clarice. Um, also, Zach, I see you. You can give a quick intro. intro. Hi, everybody. Um, Zach Schakowsky, um, Agricultural Resource Management Specialist with the Agency of Agriculture. OK, thanks. Um, yep. Can we go back to the minutes? Yes, <clears throat> yes. Um, I just wanted to let Morgan know I um, did review them and just sent one short um, edit. OK, it, are they, is it on Teams? Or you sent it to you an email. Thank you. Okay, so we'll re um we'll edit those and then the, the newest version will be on Teams for us to access. Thanks, Sarah. Um, action items, I was just going to say we're going to get to them. Um, so one of them was for us to do the EPA um, ecological risk assessment. So we are going to talk about that later on. Um, and then another one was us to look into kind of the research of the planter modifications. And we're not presenting on that today, but we kind of have a, a teaser and we're going to talk about it during the work plan review later on today. Um, and we're also going to talk about uh, the survey during our farm update. So that's kind of our action items. I think we'll be able to um, move those along. So with that, I think, um, and just if I can't see you or just just holler at me if and um, I can change things, but I think we are OK to do a farm update. So Stephanie, I think you can we'll go for that. it. Um, so we're first going to discuss. Um, Did you admit Amanda? She just popped up. Yep. She. So, I just brought her in. So hi, Amanda. Hi. Let's have her introduce herself. Okay. Go ahead, Amanda. You can introduce yourself. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I'm running late. Hi, my name is Amanda St. Pierre. I'm a dairy farmer in Berkshire. Well, well, welcome. We appreciate you being willing to serve on the board. Thank you. Looking forward to working with you. So um, go ahead, Morgan. Yep, I think Steph is up. Yeah, yeah. I oh, think, Steph. yeah, okay. we're going to, um, uh, Jill, actually, Jill Goss is going to review the updated seed report. Um, this is with respect to information that the agency was waiting on. I, I believe we gave until the end of uh, March to get information from seed companies. And I'm going to let Jill talk about the information that we got. <laughs> um, so take it away. I'll advance. Yes. Um, we did have an update. Uh, a couple of large distributors did report their seed as treated and untreated. Unfortunately, they were unable to quantify exactly what they treated it with and have asked for a little more time to do that. So. Um, this is what we have, just acknowledging that while we have new numbers in the treated and untreated category, I don't have any major changes as we advance on as to what treatments were applied to what. So here are our new numbers and one more down. Thank you. Um, overall, not much is trained changed in the seed reporting categories, a little bit of a bump up in turf, and overall the same amount of um, treated seeds in the major categories, which would be uh, corn, legume forage, and pasture, and soybean. And so I've broken it out on the next slide as to the treated versus the untreated crops. 
um, for the state. So the soybean um, has the least amount of treated to untreated in the total volume sold. Legume forage and pasture almost entirely treated and corn nearly universally treated. And next, just um, with the updated seed reports, just to give people a picture of what were the top categories of seeds. So your top three are corn, soybean, and cereal grain, with earth um, and flower vegetables closing out in the top five. But overall, it doesn't change the picture of the um, primary treated seed categories. It's still corn, soybean, and cereal grains or um, excuse me, uh, legume forage and pasture being that top three. And on the next, so the treated seed sold to dealer is uh, about 1,140 tons, and the treated seed sold to farmers is about 467 tons. Untreated seed sold to dealer is about 574 tons and untreated seeds sold to farmers is about 54 tons. So again, in both categories, primarily um, the dealers are responsible for the um, seed sold in the state. And on the treated seed, untreated seed reports, uh, we have a total reported of 2,232, almost 232 three tons of seed. Total seed tonnage reported for the state, so the amount of seed um, where tonnage fees were paid is 3,289 tons. The treated to untreated is about 72% um, treated seeds reported, and then the remaining is untreated. If we go into the next, so primarily the Treated seed is a combination of multiple products versus um, there's only a small percentage, like a 1% that actually has a single product applied to it. And on the next, primarily, if we were to break down the treatments in tons, it's primarily insecticides followed by fungicides and biologicals next. And so the, the um, top three treatment categories were fungicide, insecticide, and nematicide, with uh, less than 1% on everything else reported. So that includes, um, I had one reporter that actually reported a polymer coating on the seed without anything else. Um, and then biostimulants or biologicals and herbicides were all under uh, 1%. And this reflects that group of treatments that we don't know what was actually applied. So I can't tell you whether they were neonicotinoids or non-neonicotinoid seeds. So that's 16% of the total seed support. I've got 75% of the um, treatments reported as being a neonicotinoid and 9% as being a non-neonicotinoid. Currently, these are the reported chemical treatment agents that are applied to the seeds for portage. The next slide. Sorry, could you do that for a second? Sure. Back yeah. This one? Yeah, thank you. And then the next slide is the reported um, biological treatment agents applied. And finally, I have an, an other slide of just anything else that people have reported in. And that is the update for seed. Does anybody have any questions I might be able to answer on the fly? Yeah, this is Steve. Um, do you, of all the seed that's sold in Vermont, do you feel like you've captured most of it or do you feel like there's still some portion of seed distributed that you didn't get reports on? I think there's a, a fair number of people that I did not get reports from. 
um, reflected, if I can just go back into the total tonnage reported. Um, we're going to find the number. Just while um, Jill's looking, uh, that we do have a comprehensive seed report that's not just the abbreviated slides here that we intend on posting on the agency's website. So there'll be more information available. It's multiple pages, narrative format. Okay. <laughs> So, um, can I not find that on the slide? You just had it. Oh, is, it a, is it a slide back? Mm, it's in my notes. On okay, the slide. on the slide. All right. Yeah. Okay, so the total seed tonnage reported that people paid tonnage fees on was 3,289, almost 290 tons. And the total reported seed. And again, um, speaking to the last time that I delivered it, a lot of this might be redundant. So if um, the same container of seed passed from one distributor to another or from um, one place point of sale to another, they're required by the law to report their individual sales, not that same, even though it's the same seed that somebody else reported. So I think that there is a little bit of redundancy in the total seed report that I have of 2,233 tons. So I think there's about a thousand tons plus outstanding that somebody needs to report on. Okay. So we have a thousand tons floating around out there that we don't know if it was treated or not treated or do you any idea what crop it is or? No idea. So we could extra extrapolate and look at the rest of the data if we wanted to. However, it would be an extrapolation of, you know, it's, we mostly sell corn, right? Primarily. Primarily yeah. in the state. So I'm just wondering if we have good a good number of the, a good value of figure for the number of acres planted versus the amount of seeds sold so we can figure out if, you know what I'm saying? You know, we know how many acres of corn, how many acres of soybeans, how many acres of cereal grains, and then we can look at the seed sold and see if we're missing. I think primarily if we looked at the tonnage reporting and what what companies reported selling tonnage in, we might be able to backtrack it through a different department. Roy, do you know do they keep track of do we have good acreage numbers? I feel there's Fairly good acreage numbers. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if it's been compiled, uh -huh. uh, but I'm sure I can actually delve into it and see. Okay. I think if it'd be worth to compile, put it together. I, I think it'd be worth comparing the what we know is planted versus how much seed we're getting reported. Mm -hmm. See if we got it. Um, so Morgan, maybe that should be an action item. Compare yes, I'm hearing for. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no, just compare acreages versus seed yep. numbers and see if we're in the ballpark or. So is it just me or <clears throat> does your bro, bro kind of borrow a little bit when you hear about the treated seeds, but you don't know what treat was it treated with? So it just sounds like a small amount, but. This is um, primarily new reporting. Um, so I'm new to the agency as of January. So I'm learning the ropes. But my okay. understanding is this is the second year that um, distributors have had to actually report the seed treatments applied. Mm -hmm. And there's um, a lot of different ways of reporting. Um, some people will just come back and say, we applied a nematicide. And I've been asking, well, what, what are the active ingredients of that? And I've got limited response on that. The major reporters that, that mark that 12% have promised to send me what those are. So at a later date, the agency will have the numbers, but currently I just can't tell you what they are because they broke it down into fungicides, nematicides, right. insecticides, and that's all I have. I get it. I get it. Yeah. 
we'll, we'll be doing this annually every year and, and driving home and asking the same questions. We hope that our reporting will improve over time because we have we have a, a new employee who's helping us with that work. So we're hopeful um, it'll get better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to know that because I mean, I was kind of worried that the information was unavailable versus, you know, we're, we're you know, looking for the data is, is new, is a new approach and we will eventually get there. Yeah, definitely. I think everybody had intended on reporting as accurately as they could. I think in the, right. it's difficult to, <clears throat> I think we're the only one asking for it this way currently. Okay, that, uh, any other questions about the seed report? Right. So, uh, so um, I as well are going to give an update. Um, let me. I'm gonna sh sorry, I'm gonna share my screen back to the. I'm driving here as well. I apologize. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> All right, back to the agenda. Um, so the. And interesting, I'm sorry, our internal um, camera, what we're seeing here isn't actually showing what you all are looking at. So I don't understand why that's working that way. I apologize, everyone in the room specifically. <laughs> Again, I'm trying to show, anyway. All right, I'm just gonna move on. Um, so Last time we met, uh, the AIB discussed and agreed that it would reach out again um, to get greater participation in the agricultural um, inputs survey. Uh, just to go back, um, the numbers we got from the last survey, we had 49 respondents um, and they did represent uh, a producer or farmer from every county. So we, we met that bar. However, 49 respondents is in the significant number. I, we did, I did not look into what constitutes a statistically significant response rate on this particular survey. So I don't have that information for you. Um, but it was generally agreed that we would go back and ask for more assistance. And so the agency um, went, to, uh, discussed how we might be able to. Uh, improve the approach to try to get uh, better participation. And so the decision or the proposal that we're providing is that um, Anson, uh, Secretary Tebbets, will do direct outreach to technical service providers to ask for their assistance and get a specific answer back saying, yes, we would love to help you. <laughs> um, and then once we get that answer back, then we would, you know, produce an email and send it out to those technical service providers who would then do outreach to their list. Um, we have a, a fair number of um, organizations that we were working with before. Um, just wanted to bring them. Uh, we have the Farm Bureau. Uh, we have, um, I was thinking the IPM um, outreach group with the Pesticide Safety Education Program. Um, there's apparently an IPM group of folks that participate in that. Uh, the Vermont Tree Fruit Growers Association, Dairy Farmers of America, Agrimark, uh, Vermont Organic Farmers, uh, Vermont Dairy Producers Alliance, uh, Connecticut River Watershed Alliance, and then a couple other alliances, the Franklin Grand Isle Farmers Watershed Alliance, um, the, Ver the Vegetable and Berry Growers Association, Northeast Organic Farmers Association, Vermont Sugar Makers Association, Northern Grain Growers, uh, Vermont Horse Council, Vermont Sheep and Goat Association, Young Farmers Coalition of Vermont, Champlain Valley Farmer Coalition, Vermont Farm Agriculture Health and Safety Alliance, uh, the Vermont Association of Conservation Districts, the New Hampshire Vermont Christmas Tree, Associ uh, Christmas Tree Growers Association, and the Vermont Grass Farmers Association. So those are all the associations that we would seek um, a commitment from via an email from Anson. Um, and then we would send it out again uh, to those to those organizations after they've given us the commitment. And then they would provide a link to the survey and then hopefully, you know, we would, the survey would be open for another two weeks um, and we would go for there. So that, that's our proposal. 
this point in time. And I have Anson. Anson is ready. Is ready. He's like, just let me know when I need to hit send. So I can confirm that Anson's going to um, help us. Any, any comments or questions about that approach? Does that sound like the way to go? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else, Stephanie, as far as an update? That's all I have for an update. Um, nothing else from me. I don't know if um, this Dave. Dave, you're on the call. Do you have an update for us? Uh, he just texted. He, he's going. He's lost reception because of travel. So okay. if he comes back in, we'll we'll bring him back in. Um, why don't we go ahead and uh, move on? Uh, Andrew, are you uh, ready to proceed? I am, Steve. Sorry, it took me a minute to get unmuted there. That's okay. Well, welcome. Thank you. So I'm pretty familiar with Zoom, but not overly familiar with Teams. So somebody is going to need to talk me through how to share a screen. So right up next to your big red leave button, there should be a box with an arrow pointing up. Yep, it says That's open share tray. Uh, mine doesn't say that, but it should say share, something about share. So if you press that, but yeah. And then you should have an option to share your screen or a certain window, yeah. window of okay. your screen. Well, uh, yep, give me a second. And I think you should be able to be a share if it's. OK, give me a second. It looks I had my window already and it looks like maybe it closed while we were. Waiting. Um, that's fine. Well, I have a question. So while you're going, I'll ask my question. Um, Steve, just because I didn't see any nods in the room or anything. So our. Are the board members in agreement with that proposal for the survey plan? Yes. Okay. OK, I'm going to try that again. Hey. Yep, we can see Can that. you guys see that now? Yep. OK, so I can't see any of you, and I'm not going to, I guess, struggle to try and get the little gallery that Zoom gives you. So if anybody has a question, just sing out. That sound like a plan? Yes, sir. Sounds good. Great. OK, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Andrew Munkras. I am currently the president of the Vermont Beekeepers Association. I've been on the board of directors there for six years, and I'm a commercial beekeeper from Cornwall, Vermont. And I spoke with you folks last in July. So for those of you that were on the AIB at that point, uh, we talked generally about the effects of neonics on bees and uh, generalized exposure, and that was very short notice, and I was out of state, so I didn't have any time to prepare anything other than, you know, a verbal talk. This time I've put together a slideshow for you, and Morgan asked me to specifically address the effects on honeybee colonies of neonic treated seed. And so that's uh, what this is limited to. However, we are going to talk a little bit about exposure uh, because that's it's pretty important to explore exposure routes and levels so that we know what uh, likelihood the studies have of, of being real world situations. So we're going to start out by talking about that. 
So a little bit of background uh, for those of you who don't keep honeybees. Uh, honeybees, what you see here is a honeybee who's foraging for pollen. Honeybees eat nectar and pollen and they store it within the hive to feed themselves. And as beekeepers, we're lucky that they're not so good at math and they actually usually store more nectar than they need to make it through a whole season, which provides the surplus that we can harvest for uh, a commercial crop. The pollen is collected on a more day-to-day -day basis. They don't stockpile that because they don't need it over the winter. So that's much more an immediate thing. And within a hive, if pollen is used to feed the brood, adult bees can survive just fine on carbohydrates, which would be the sugar and the nectar. But the developing larva need to be fed pollen. And in this picture, the brown capped honeycomb cells at the bottom of the picture are uh, what we call brood. It's pupating larva. The white grub looking things that are in the cells kind of across the middle of the picture are larva, which are developing honeybees. And then up towards the top of the picture, you'll see some different colored cells uh, with some kind of pasty substance in it, and that is pollen. And the bees store it adjacent to the brood and it is fed to the brood mixed with nectar after being processed in the mandibular glands of the worker bees. Here's another example. You'll see the capped brood. You can see the, the uncapped larva. You can see the band of pollen surrounding the larva. You can see nectar, which is glistening. And then once it's been dried to 18% moisture and capped, we refer to it as honey. So that's all relevant because these are all potential exposure routes to neonex for the honeybees. Any questions about any of that? Very good. That is a serious Reader's Digest version of uh, honeybee physiology and uh, nutrition, but it should be enough to, to make it through the rest of this. So obviously today we're talking about uh, neonic seed treatments. We're not addressing fungicidal seed treatments or other insecticide classes beyond uh, the nitroguanidine neonics. And you guys were talking about the actual cropland acres. I've got some old data. I'm sure you have much more up to date, but we're talking about somewhere north of 86,000 acres of corn and you know, considerably less than that of soybeans. And so pretty significant acreage of corn in recent years, anecdotally, we've seen a lot more soybeans being grown. They're both extremely commonly treated with the neonex. Uh, the three nitroguanidine that we're mostly interested in are clothianidin, imidacloprid, and thiomethoxam, and they're all uh, highly toxic to pollinators. So what we've got here, uh, this was developed for me by a UVM student who works at the UVM B lab. And I know there's been some discussions in the past after presenting to the AIB about why can't we just move the bees away from the cornfields or why can't we have sanctuary areas that are planted with pollinator friendly plants that will help protect the honeybees from the crop fields. Uh, it's, we already have areas that are not, where neonics are not used and the bees are still getting exposed. And part of that is because of the flight range of the honeybee, they can fly up to five miles from the hive looking for food. That's pretty unusual. So we included uh, circles of three mile uh, radius here. And these are registered locations. Uh, honeybee apiaries have to be registered with the Department of Agriculture. So there's a database of where they are located. Uh, the forested areas of Vermont are not conducive to raising honeybees. 
uh, because they starve to death. There needs to be roughly an acre in bloom continuously through the course of the growing season within flight range of a honeybee colony in order for it to survive and produce enough honey to make it through the winter. And in the forested areas, you'll get plenty of bloom in the spring when the trees are blooming and many of the trees actually produce nectar. But then after that, there's basically nothing uh, in the forested areas. So when you look at a map of the state, all the honeybee yards will be concentrated in the agricultural valleys. So honeybee raising and honey production overlaps with the rest of Vermont agriculture. So what we've done here is taken the agricultural land and using uh, GIS imagery, we've figured out which fields are in row crops. Uh, and it's uh, you can see by the key that it's marked whether it's corn or whether it's soybeans. And then the circles that are overlaid are the flight ranges of the apiaries that are located in these particular areas. So this one is Addison County. Here we've got Franklin County. Here's some close-ups just to give you a sense of how, uh, how dense the, the cropland is. And there's really two problems with cropland, one which is surmountable and the other one which isn't. The surmountable problem is that the, the crop fields are extremely clean of weeds and what a farmer would call a weed, a beekeeper would call a wildflower, and the honeybees can forage on it. So the areas that are in crops are not particularly useful forage for honeybees, except in the case of soybeans, which does produce nectar and pollen. Corn does produce pollen for a period in the late summer. Uh, it's not very high quality, but honeybees are unable to determine the quality of pollen unlike they are able to determine the quality of nectar. So they'll often gather corn pollen, but through the rest of the year, that cropland is not useful as a food source. The bigger problem is that those areas are largely toxic to honeybees due to uh, the neonicotinoid seed treatments that are used. So what you're looking at when we look at this map is the acreage, which is potentially uh, toxic to honeybees where they're likely to have some kind of an exposure if they're flying there during planting, if they're collecting pollen or nectar from field adjacent crops, or if they're collecting pollen from the crop itself. Uh, this is a chart showing the increase in acute insecticide toxic loading for uh, cropland. This is especially interesting because one of the reasons the neonics have become so popular is because you don't get the catastrophic bee kills that you used to get with the organophosphates and some of the other classes of pesticides. But in reality, in reality the overall toxic loading of the cropland has been increasing since well, uh, for a couple decades now. So if we look at it by chemical class, you can see that most of that increase in toxic loading on cropland is due to the neonicotinoids. And when they're looking at the uh, overall toxic loading of cropland, you're looking at a combination of the toxicity, the likelihood of exposure, the persistence of the chemicals that are being used, and the modes of dissipation of the chemicals that are being used. So that's all taken into consideration. So personally, when I look at this graph, I think it's hardly surprising that we've been seeing increased honeybee losses since roughly 2008, since the toxic loading of cropland uh, increases quite sharply at that same time. So as we look at the cropland that's been treated with Neonics, which as we know are systemic pesticides, there's several routes of application. Uh, 
And there's a couple here that we're going to ignore because it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but we're specifically interested in the seed treatments. So we've got dust from planting. Uh, we've got uh, pesticides that have been taken up by the plants and are present in the pollen and the nectar. We've got soil borne levels of pesticides which are expressed in the gutation water, which is fluid from inside the plant, which is expressed out through the pores of the plant. And then we actually have uh, pesticides in the surface water. Uh, in the case of native pollinators, the soil levels of neonics are an issue because there are ground nesting native pollinators, but honeybees don't nest in the ground, so we won't uh, talk about that today but we will talk about the other four. So starting out uh, with dust, regardless of what type of planter you have, whether it's a mechanical plate planter or an air planter, there is a certain amount of dust which is uh, released. This is an image here from Purdue University. And that dust can be both acutely toxic and uh, toxic in a chronic manner, depending on how the bees encounter it. Uh, it's well known that if honeybees happen to be flying across a crop field while it's being planted, even though we may not see a cloud of dust behind the planter, there is enough uh, particulate of the neonicotinoids in the air to kill the honeybees uh, as they're flying. And uh, often they won't make it back to the hive. Uh, they'll die extremely quickly. There's also uh, a risk of that dust landing on non-crop plants. And uh, studies show that the levels of dust can be up to nine parts per billion. Uh, there have been some studies that show them being even higher than that, but nine parts per billion on field adjacent crops is pretty typical. And that level, if a honeybee is foraging, say, on these dandelions while this field is being no-till planted with neonic treated corn, uh, those honeybees would also likely uh, receive an acutely lethal dose. And if the dandelions are, say, a little bit outside, of the crop field, those bees might pick up enough neonics that it would become a, a lower level uh, exposure and a, a chronic type exposure. We did, uh, I'll show you some testing that we did last summer later and we did find um, levels of neonics in field adjacent crops. So this is uh, a real thing that's happening, whether it's by transference of planting dust or whether it's movement through the soil uh, with runoff water and then being uptake by uh, adjacent plants. So let's talk a little bit about gutation fluid. Uh, some people are familiar with this and some people this is new information. So I'll take just a couple of slides to talk about this. You can think of it sort of like the sap of the plant, uh, but it's often simply water that the plant has pulled up and then is expressed out through the pores of the plant. Uh, usually happens when the plant is fairly young. With corn, it typically happens until it's somewhere between two and three feet tall. And uh, the concern here is that uh, Barron's in 2021 showed that the levels of neonics in gutation fluid are just outrageous. So uh, Imid Lacorpid, they came up with 47,000 parts per billion. Clothianidin came up with 23,000 parts per billion. And uh, Thiam Mixotham came up with almost 12,000 parts per billion. So these levels are way beyond uh, acutely toxic. And they also found no levels below 10,000 parts per billion, and the highest levels were up to around 200,000 parts per billion. Uh, 
So these levels are way beyond acute toxicity to bees. And this graph right here will show you how quickly the bees die after drinking the getation fluid from uh, crop plants that are treated with either of these three major neonics. So the, the mean is between three and a half and you know five, four and three quarter, five and a half minutes. Uh, so these bees might make it back to the hive depending on how far away the cornfield is, uh, but a lot of them aren't going to. And so this is not necessarily gonna show up as a pesticide kill where you have big piles of dead bees in front of the hive. The, this is just gonna be foragers that never return. They, they die in the field, they die on the way back. If you have a crop which has slightly lower levels and the bees don't die immediately, then they'll bring the contaminated fluid back to the hive to feed to the brood and cause all kinds of other problems. So the, the, the reason gutation fluid is an issue is because it is foraged on, as you can see in this picture, it is foraged on by bees uh, for the purpose of water, which is used to dilute nectar, honey, and pollen and turn it into brood food. And they'll collect from people's swimming pools, they'll collect from mud puddles, they'll collect from streams and rivers. And we'll talk about the surface water contamination uh, in a little bit. But uh, by far the highest levels uh, are found in the cutation fluid. And uh, it has pretty serious consequences to the, to the colonies. Now there's several routes. So we talked about acute exposure. And as I said, some of those methods of acute exposure can also turn into chronic exposure. Uh, but there are some mechanisms of chronic exposure which are specific. Uh, surface water we mentioned, uh, when they say plant exudates, they're talking about uh, gutation fluid. Occasionally, if a crop is infested with aphids, the aphids will actually produce a sweet substance called honeydew. But if the crop has been treated with neonics, there aren't going to be any aphids feeding on it because the aphids are all going to be dead. So that's not a big concern uh, here anyway. The nectar could be a potential exposure and pollen could be potential exposure. In general, the nectar seems to contain less lower levels of neonics than uh, the pollen does. And it's very difficult to measure the abraded dust but you can um, measure it on field adjacent crops uh, by taking plant tissue samples once it's been absorbed by the plant. So all of those chronic exposure methods affect the, the foraging worker bees and they can get stored in the hive. They can get mixed with the brood food, which affects the young bees in the hive. It affects the larva, the brood, and it can also potentially affect the queen. So if you guys are willing, we're gonna go off into the weeds here and look at some of the research that specifies some of the effects on the colony and on the developing larva and on the queens. You guys good with that? Yep. All right, looking at water, we already talked about how water is collected to uh, mix with the larval food as the bees are raising replacement bees. It's also used to cool the hive. So you can have uh, exposures from uh, oral ingestion, which would be when the water gets mixed with the brood food, or you can have contact exposures because the bees are spreading the water around the hive and it's getting on other worker bees and it's getting on the larva uh, as they're using evaporative cooling to cool the hive in the summer. And uh, let's see who did this study. Uh, that was Barron's in 2021. They found that the average level of neonics in surface water in agricultural watersheds, and we're not talking about puddles actually in the fields, we're talking about streams in agricultural watersheds. The level is about 
parts per billion. And as we'll see later, that level is actually well above the uh, LOEC or lowest observable effect concentration for the three NAOMEX we're uh, discussing. The other exposure uh, is through the pollen. And this one is, is fairly easy to sample for. So in 2021, we partnered with UVM. They had a graduate student who was looking to do a, a thesis project on pollen collection and species identification to see which species were being foraged on by honeybees throughout the state. So there were four locations that were sampled and the VBA partially funded, uh, gave a grant to this student to perform this work because this was something we wanted to add to our database and share with the public. And in addition, we provided uh, extra funding to get any sample that was big enough tested for pesticide residue. Uh, as long as the samples were being collected, we figured we'd get them tested for pesticides. So at the lower right, what you see is a pollen trap, which knocks the pollen from the baskets on the bee's hind legs. And you can't do this for any length of time or the colony will become pollen starved. So you typically do it for 24 to 48 hours with a specific colony, give them a break so that they can uh, have food to feed the larva again. And this, uh, these samples, there were 16 samples that were big enough uh, to be sent into the lab. We used the, the DICE lab at Cornell. They sample for 93 different pesticides and they have a very low uh, level of detection. So it's advantageous for that. And you can see by the pie graph, uh, which ones, which types of pesticides we found with the yellow, uh, pie slice on the left, just under 8% being the neonex. And what I'd like to point out here with this pie graph, this shows the sampling. It was conducted each month through the growing season. So May, June, July, August, and September. And again, in this, in this bar graph, the neonex are represented by the yellow. And you'll see that we got some pretty significant neonic hits in May. We got just a little bit in June, then nothing in July, and then again in August. And this correlates with exposure in May due to planting and possibly exposure of field adjacent crops. And then by July, uh, everything's kind of settled down a little bit. And then in August, typically the corn tassels. And so that's when you see uh, levels of exposure beginning to rise again. And if you look down on the lower graph, uh, on the left-hand side, kind of in the middle, you'll see the three big hitters along with thiocloprid, uh, which was detected, but is uh, not typically used as a seed treatment. So here's a little graph of the pesticide detections through time. And I just wanna compare that with the University of Guelph uh, chart of the population cycle of a well-managed colony of honeybees. So what you've got in the middle is the middle of the winter when they are at their smallest population. And in May and June, they are building up to their largest population, which is in July. So what you have is colonies that are attempting to replace their winter bees and build up to a size where they'll produce enough bees and store enough honey to survive the winter. And during that buildup period, which is critical to their survival, that's when they are being exposed to the first round of neonix. The second exposure happens on the far side of the curve when the population is declining as they're shrinking back down to their winter population. And at that point, the bees are raising what we call the winter bees. And the winter bees are morphologically different. They live longer and they have different proteins in their fat bodies and they are raised at a very critical time of year. And if those bees are not healthy, the colony will not survive the winter. 
Unfortunately, they're being raised in August, which is when they get the second exposure to neonicotinoids. And here's just a mention, you may see this piperonal butoxide, which is, you know, technically labeled as an inert ingredient, but it actually increases the level of the, the toxicity of, of various neonics by many, many fold. So some of these quote inert ingredients actually make ever, uh, make the, the pesticides much, much more toxic for the honeybees. Based on the uh, interesting results from 2021, in 2022, we set out more pollen traps and uh, once again collected samples and sent them to Cornell for analysis. They are kind of a preeminent lab for testing or pesticide residues. And as a result, they're very backed up. So we turned these in last fall and we got these results on Friday. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to Samantha Alger at the UVM B Lab, who didn't have time to make a bunch of nifty bar graphs like she did for the 2021 data, but she did create this nice chart, uh, which show, shows us the levels that were found in 2022. And they're color coded. The yellow are comparatively low levels that are still well above the lowest observable effect concentration. And those are likely to cause behavioral changes in the bees. The ones that are coded in orange are high enough to cause physiological changes in the bees. And the sample that is coded in red is enough to cause all of the previous problems as well as reproductive problems uh, in the colonies. So, uh, this is not insignificant at all. 24% uh, of the pollen samples contained levels of neonics that were above the LOEC, and 14% of the plant tissue samples contained uh, levels of neonics that were above the LOEC. So uh, when I testified last time, to the AIB, there was some question about whether these studies uh, done in the US at large were really relevant to Vermont. There was some question as to whether somehow Vermont was special and we weren't exposing the honeybees to the neonics here. Uh, obviously, uh, we are. They, this is, this, uh, this is parallel to what's being found in other parts of the country. Uh, so we are not surprised. The, um, there may be some questions. The Agency of Ag also did some testing with a smaller number of samples in summer of 2022. And those were sent out to the lab and those came back with no detections for neonics. And at this point, uh, I've chatted with Brooke Decker, who's the pollinator health specialist, and we're not sure if that's a result of the timing of the sampling or the sensitivity of the equipment at the lab where it was sent. The state uses a lab in California and the B lab uses uh, the lab at Cornell. So both the B lab and uh, the agency of ag will be doing additional testing this coming summer. But uh, I think it's pretty clear what we found. Any additional testing will simply be to corroborate what we've already found. Uh, this chart shows you the LOECs for uh, several different neonic pesticides. The big three that we're interested in are clothianidin, imidacloprid, and thiamethoxam. And as you can see with those three, the LD50 is, uh, let's look at clothianidin, the LD50 is 0.04 micrograms per B and a B weighs a gram. So that is comparable to 0.04 parts per billion. And if you look at the low, lowest observable effect concentration through oral ingestion, 
we're talking 0. 0.0005 micrograms per B, which again is comparable to 0. 0.0005 parts per billion. So uh, one thing I really wanna stress here is just how incredibly sensitive the pollinators and honeybees specifically are and how toxic the neonics are. Uh, you guys were talking about how many tons of seed were planted each year in Vermont, all of it treated by with neonics or 99% of it treated with neonics or something or 16% I guess treated with something we don't know what it is regardless vast amount of it treated with neonics. I've heard a figure of somewhere around 12 tons of actual neonic coating being used, whereas it would take only one teaspoon of neonics to kill every single bee in the entire state of Vermont. So that's the level of toxicity that we're talking about. So understanding that and the lowest observable effect concentration, and when we're talking about lowest observable effect, Let's be clear, these are lowest observable adverse effect concentrations. So these are effects that scientists have noticed that have a strongly adverse effect on the colony. So, sorry, I'm going to have to um, line my notes up. I don't have the slide numbers on this uh, screen, so my notes are based on the slide number, so I'll just try and, and get synchronized again. Okay, this one's from TOSI 2017, and they um, exposed worker bees to 1.3 billionths of a gram, so that's 1.3 nanograms per bee uh, in a single exposure, and so that's roughly equivalent to 1.3 parts per billion, although you can't, you know, a B isn't a solution, so it's not a direct correlation, but I did try to convert everything into the same units. All of these studies are done with different units and it can get super confusing, but we're basically talking about extremely low levels of exposure and the light colored bars are untreated and the darker colored bars are bees that have been dosed uh, with thiamethoxam and at, at very low concentrations. And what happens is the bees are much more likely to fall down. They're much more likely to spend time at the bottom of the hive, which is where the bees hang out, where they don't, uh, when they're not doing any work they're much more likely to exhibit bizarre abnormal behaviors. They're much more likely to be unable to climb and they are uh, likely to have difficulty following the light, which is critical to honeybee navigation. So for comparison, picture a field of sheep, which has been exposed to a neurotoxin, which causes them to wander around aimlessly, fall down, uh, bash into things, and be unable to walk up a hill. And this is the comparison with a hive of worker bees that have been exposed and are behaving uh, like what we've seen in this study. And obviously with insects, nobody's gonna be that concerned unless you're a beekeeper, but if it were happening to somebody's farm animals and they were behaving like that, it would be horrifying. Um, this one's from Charlatan 2015, and they uh, used a dose of about 3.8 parts per billion of uh, IMD. And what you can see basically is over a period of time, uh, honeybees generally live five to six weeks in the summer. And what we're seeing is instead of living for the full 60 days, bees that have been dosed uh, with imidacloprid 
are much more likely to start dying off around the 30 day mark. So their life expectancy is about half of uh, what you would normally expect. Interestingly, the difference between four and eight micrograms per liter or four and eight parts per billion is pretty minimal. So the, 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 the worst case scenario is already happening at uh, the lower level. Uh, this is a study that was done by Tyson in 2020 on foraging. And this graph is a little bit harder to understand, but they the, their low dose was four and a half parts per billion. Their high dose was nine parts per billion, which we didn't find in pollen, but which would be a very low dose of exposure to gutation fluid or something like that. Uh, or potentially you'd get a nine parts per billion exposure from planting dust on field adjacent crops in the springtime. So these are again, uh, field realistic exposures. And uh, basically what it shows is greatly reduced foraging and fewer recruitment dances. So when the bees come back from foraging, they dance to recruit other foragers to their crop. And if they've been exposed to neonics, they're less likely to dance and they're less likely to successfully recruit other foragers when they do dance. And interestingly, the lower section of the graph shows that it takes a higher sugar concentration in the nectar of the plant to keep the foragers going back. So the bees are basically losing their motivation uh, to forage and it takes a much, much sweeter solution to keep them returning to the food source. So uh, significant impacts within the hive on foraging and obviously foraging is key to the honeybee survival and the colony's survival as a whole through the winter and through any dearth that you might have. Uh, this one, the, the only graph we want to look at here is in the lower left corner, which is thiamethoxum and uh, this is from Yang 2012, and uh, nope, sorry, this one is also Charitin. And uh, what this is, is a graph of bees that have been exposed to thiamethoxum. And they, the, the, the worker bees within the hive, we call them house bees, travel all around and do necessary jobs, cleaning cells, feeding larva, uh, removing mites from larva if they're parasitized, you know, all kinds of jobs, packing pollen, collecting nectar from field bees. And what they found, they set up a video camera and watched marked bees throughout the day. And they found that bees that had been exposed to neonics moved less than half as far through the course of a day than ones that had not. And so basically any worker that's exposed to thiamethoxum is going to be doing less than half the work of the control worker bees that have not been exposed. So again, these are symptoms that you wouldn't see, even a beekeeper wouldn't see this if they were just looking at a colony and they would write off the colony's failure to thrive on something else. It's very difficult to see these things unless you do have a video camera set up and you're watching specific bees throughout the course of a day. Uh, here's another graph on IMD. Uh, this one's Yang, 2012. And what they did is they exposed bees to 0.4 or 0.04 uh, or a couple of even lower levels uh, of IMD. And uh, NG, we're talking nanograms. So these are incredibly low doses here. And in the lower graph, what you see is that the two higher levels, which are still incredibly low, 0.4 and 0.04, those bees had an extremely impaired olfactory associative memory. And that what's, what that means is they don't remember smells. And the reason that's relevant 
is that when honeybees are foraging, they bring back samples of the nectar that they're foraging on, and they share the smell of that nectar with all the other workers in the hive to help them locate the crop that they're foraging on when they get recruited and go out and look for it. And what's happening is because neonics are a neurotoxin, the bee's memory is getting messed up and they're losing the ability to remember smells as part of the process of forager recruitment and, uh, and nectar location when they're actually flying out into the field. So uh, I could obviously go on all afternoon uh, with more and more studies, uh, but I'll, you, I think you get the sense. It's, it's pretty significant. The doses are fairly low. Uh, the second thing I want to hit on is the fact that uh, these insecticides aren't just working on their own. Uh, obviously, they're also interacting with the fungicides and with the inert ingredients and the tank mixes and all that, but that is beyond the scope of this talk. And uh, I was asked to stick directly to the neonics, but just know that the overall toxicity of the neonics can be greatly increased depending on what has been mixed uh, with it, either on a seed coating or in a tank mix if you're talking an orchard spray. Uh, with seed coatings, we're mostly talking fungicides, and there are some fungicides that will greatly increase the toxicity of the neonics. What we're looking at here in this section, however, is the increase in toxicity when you combine an innate pathogen of the honeybee with a pesticide exposure. And this is a report from APHIS which is the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service of the USDA. And we participate in the National Honeybee Survey every year and we get our colonies sampled. And you, uh, they report back on many things. One is the total number of varroa mites that were in the sample of bees that they had and the nosema load. And these are probably the two most uh, important pathogen and pest of honeybees at the current time. Uh, the nosema is a uh, fungal pathogen that lives in the gut. It's spore forming and it can sicken the bees. The varroa mites are an external parasite which feed on the fat bodies of the honeybees. And the big problem with them, aside from weakening the bees somewhat by sucking their fat bodies, uh, is they are a, a, a vector of viruses. So managing varroa mites uh, is important for control. However, we're seeing honeybee losses even in colonies that have been properly managed for varroa. And that's where these synergies come into play. So in this picture, you can see a mite uh, on the thorax of a honeybee. And this honeybee has been afflicted with deformed wing virus. And uh, it obviously exposure during the larval stage causes a malformation of the wings and this worker bee will be unable to fly. Now what's extremely interesting here is that the mites can spread these viruses on their own, but when you combine a exposure to virus mediated by the mites with an exposure to neonic pesticides, which is that far right-hand graph, you can see that the clinical incidence of deformed wing virus uh, increases from about 10% to probably 17% during the summer when the bees are a little more able to fight things off and increases from about 6% to 18% uh, as a mean during the fall, which is when it's critical to be, as I talked about before, it's critical to have healthy colonies there. So uh, a neonic exposure, and these ex this exposure was uh, a 0.3 parts per billion exposure to clothianidin 
or a 0.6 part per billion exposure to thiamethoxam. And that's from Kulon in 2017. Uh, so you can see how, again, this would not appear to the beekeeper as being anything other than a bad case of virus, but you could have controlled your mites and have a very low level of deformed wing virus until you have a pesticide exposure during corn tasseling time, which can then cause an increase in your virus loading. Uh, here we've got, this is an exposure of about 0.7 parts per billion. That's the left-hand graph. Then they did some higher exposures, but the, the trends uh, remain the same. And this is a synergy between a neonic exposure and a nosema load. And what you can see is that the neonic by itself does not cause a tremendous amount of mortality at that level uh, and within the time frame. But once you combine it with a nosema infection, uh, it increases by roughly 30%. So again, 30% might not sound like much, but the margins of error for getting your colonies through the winter are much closer than 30%. So an increase of 30% in your nosema loads is pretty significant. Uh, this is another indicator of things, same study. This is another indicator of what's happening uh, with the bees, the left-hand chart is glucose oxidase activity, and glucose oxidase is a antibiotic that is added by the worker bees from their hypopharyngeal glands into the brood food. So they're basically sterilizing the food as they're feeding it to the larva. And what you can see here, if you look at uh, the control or a simple neonic exposure or a simple nosema exposure compared with the combination of nosema and the neonic, uh, everything's pretty stable until you combine the nosema and the neonic, and then you see a, a drop off in glucose oxidase uh, activity, which then results potentially in uh, contaminated brood food, which would then allow um, pathogens to spread within the larval population of the hive. The second chart shows you that uh, a combination of nosema and a neonic exposure actively reduces the size of those hypopharyngeal glands that the worker bees possess that again are used to produce the brood food. So it's limiting the bees ability to feed their sisters. Uh, this this one is thio thiocloprid, which uh, I only included because it's a significant finding and we did get a hit in the pollen collection for thiocloprid. And uh, this again is a synergy between nosema and insecticides. And what you're basically looking at, the green line there shows about a 40% mortality at 20 days. And with the combination of the nosema and the thiocloprid, it's up to about 70%. So it's an increase again in about 30% in mortality at day 20, when these bees should normally be living until day 60. Uh, here's some more mortality studies. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got uh, bees that are uninfected by nosema and bees that are infected by nosema. And then on the right hand side, you've got bees that have been exposed to about five parts per billion of thiamethoxam. And the uninfected bees are down around 50%, but the infected bees are up around 77%. Interestingly, that was worker bees. Uh, the folks that did this study, this is Vidal from 2011, and these folks thought to test drones, which are the males, and the males, for whatever reason, 
are basically completely wiped out by the combination of nosema and thiamethoxam. So uh, obviously you have to have drones in order to mate your queens, and that's a pretty good segue into the next section. I'll take a brief pause. I've been kind of cruising right along trying to get through this in the hour allotted, but I'm happy to take a brief pause and answer any questions if anyone has anything. Is everybody still awake? <laughs> Andrew, I have a question. It's more of a request. Is when you um, provide this presentation, would you be able to provide the citations of the studies that you are? Um, the citations? Some of them are in the slides, but I know some of them, I'm just trying to phonetically spell a name that you're saying. So if you're able to in the future, just when we have this to provide the, the citations. The citations are all on the last slide of the presentation. Awesome. Thank you. So I did include them, but I didn't try and add them into the individual That's okay. slides. That's fine, as long uh, as they're there. Thanks. Yep, they're, they're all there. And uh, if you're trying to track down a particular slide, you can just shoot me an email and I can help you out. I'm not so much of a computer genius. Um, and so editing images on PowerPoint is not something I was going to try and figure out how to do. You're doing fine. Thank you. As long as they're there somewhere. I just know yep. I wasn't nope, doing the names there. justice. Thank you. Yep, they're all there uh, on the last slide. Okay, so queens and colony strength. So we talked about synergisms. There's also a number of studies that have dealt with uh, effects on queens. And uh, just so you understand, again, this is common knowledge about, among beekeepers, but just to get us all up to the same level, the queen is the mother of every bee within an individual colony. And what we call a colony, uh, uh, a layperson might call a hive. To us, the hive is actually the box that the bees are in. And the family of bees that's living within the boxes or within the hollow tree is a colony. And they're all related. And the queen is the mother of all of them. So there is only one fertile female in the entire colony. And the success of the queen, the health of the queen, determines the health and success of the colony. So effects on uh, effects on the queen are drastically amplified uh, in, in the success of the colony or effects on the colony. So uh, this study is Sandrock 2014. And uh, what we're looking at here is the actual overall colony performance. And this is pretty telling. What she used was a five parts per billion exposure to thiamethoxam and a two parts per billion exposure to clothianidin. And what you're looking at, the black data points are control and the red data points are uh, exposed. And so what you see uh, with overall colony population in the spring of 2011, control and treated are roughly the same. But by the summer, you're seeing that while the control colony has grown to over 30,000 bees, and I say colony, but there's multiple colonies because obviously there's a, a significant spread within each group. But the, the control colonies are over 30,000 for a mean, and the exposed colonies are much lower, down around maybe 22,000. And then again, they even out in fall of 2011. And then the following spring, with no exposure since the previous year, the colony that was exposed uh, is significantly weaker than the control colony. And again, this is not something that a beekeeper is necessarily going to be able to figure out why their colony is so weak, but we've all been seeing weak colonies with no explanation. And uh, this is certainly uh, a fairly obvious uh, cause. The other two graphs are merely uh, correlating what you see at the top, which is number of eggs and larva and number of viable pupa. Um, those obviously are simply precursors to overall colony strength. So uh, we won't deal with them separately. 
Um, this one is from Williams 2015. And uh, what we're looking at here is actually uh, figure one is whether the queen survived. And they came to the conclusion that no significant difference was observed between uh, the neonic exposed bees and the control bees. However, in I, I'm, I'm a queen breeder and we raise and sell over a thousand queens every year. And a difference between 20% dead queens and 40% dead queens, I would consider statistically significant. Certainly in my operation, if I went 40% of my queens being dead, I would be pretty upset. So the exposure they used here uh, was four parts per billion thiamethoxam and one part per billion clothianidin. And again, both uh, realistic uh, levels of exposure in the field. Uh, the second figure, same exposures, uh, shows the likelihood of a young queen uh, producing eggs. And again, uh, much more likely to have no eggs if they've been exposed to neonics, over 40%. That's awful. We usually expect, you know, maybe 5 to 10% of the queens to not produce uh, eggs from after mating. And in the lower, they are producing eggs, but they are not successfully producing fertilized worker eggs. Uh, diploid offspring become workers, haploid offspring become drones. And so again, we're seeing a difference between about 20 and uh, 45%, 48% uh, in successful, queens being successful at raising uh, worker bees. Um, this one's from uh, Spivak in 2016. And uh, the dosages are right there on the screen. The orange is the control. These are some higher dosages, uh, but it's worthwhile including this because uh, the, the scale is the number of eggs that were laid within a 15 minute window. And you notice that even at the 10 parts per billion level, uh, you're seeing a significant drop off in eggs being laid by a queen. And uh, this can dramatically affect your colony population rate. You have all those bees dying at 60 days old and they need to be replaced by a queen that's capable of laying 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. And if their egg laying rate has been cut in half, you will not have a colony that can propagate enough worker bees to replace the bees that are dying through natural attrition. And this is what these brood patterns look like uh, from these queens that have had exposure. Uh, I think the 10 parts per billion and the 20 parts per billion pattern are maybe what might be realistic. The higher levels of exposure that they tested would happen in the springtime when they're being exposed to planting dust or to gutation fluids. So they aren't to be ignored, um, but uh, Certainly a queen that's exposed at that time uh, might not recover and would need to be replaced uh, or they would be laying very slowly for the rest of the season. This is from one of David Tarpey's grad students, uh, Joe Malone, and this is uh, 2022. And what they did is they looked at the composition of the food that is fed to the queen to try and determine why we're seeing such significant effects in queen productivity. And um, they used very low levels, so 0. 0.6 parts per billion of imidacloprid and 0. 0.3 parts per billion of thiamethoxam. And what you're seeing from the left-hand side, which was exposed to neonix versus the right-hand side is concentrations above or below the baseline of uh, phytosterols, which are indicative of the quality of the royal jelly, which is fed to the queen. And so basically what's happening is there's hardly any nutritional content 
to the royal jelly that's being fed to the queen when the nurse bees are exposed to very low levels of neonicotinoids. And once this queen has been raised, there's no going back. They've had this poor nutrition. Uh, they end up being less productive and shorter lived. And I'll just add here that if you go to the Bee Informed Partnership, um, they will have information there explaining how loss of queen productivity, increase in queen replacement and supersedure has become one of the major concerns of commercial beekeepers all over the country. So this is, uh, this is some explanation of, of uh, why that is happening and the, the, the root causes. Now this chart here was put together by uh, VBA board member Fred Putnam this year. And this is a kind of a good example of how the queen's productivity can drastically affect the overwintering success of a colony of bees. So if you recall, we were seeing differences in productivity that were 50%, uh, you know, queens that were only 50% as productive as their untreated uh, counterparts and other uh, queen measures that were varying by 30% or more. What Fred's done here is he's calculated out uh, the colony population with a dwindling rate increased by 3% due to a reduction in queen productivity of only 3%, 2%, and 1%. So these are much, much lower than the levels of uh, difference in queen productivity that we were seeing in these studies where the queens were exposed to, to field reasonable levels of neonics. And what's happening is by March, in an unexposed colony, you might have 7,500 bees remaining, which is getting pretty close to the minimum viable population to maintain colony warmth through the winter. And what happens if you have a 3% drop in queen productivity is that minimum population drops to just over 2,000 bees. And that is not a viable unit to get through uh, any cold weather. The honeybees survive the winter by generating their own heat by consuming honey. And there's a minimum cluster size which is needed to uh, survive just, just to keep their sisters warm and make it through the winter. And all of us uh, beekeepers have seen these tiny clusters that had been uh, colonies the previous year and that dwindled down to these tiny colonies and then died over the winter. And this is a uh, graphic example of how that can happen. So moving on to what the VBA recommends, obviously you guys know all about IPM, so I won't harp on it. Uh, and an important component of IPM is to choose the least toxic pesticide option. And it, you'll notice uh, here in the bumblebee toxicity section, they're talking about the toxicity of dimides, way less toxic than neonics. So if you look at the dimides, uh, cyanotronilaprol is, a dimide, it's available as a seed treatment. Its persistence in the soil is about 90 days as it compared to 3.8 years for the three neonics that we're talking about. And they could not create a solution with cyanotronilaprol that was concentrated enough to kill 50% of the bumblebees that they tested against. Uh, and the LD50 for honeybees was 0.1 micrograms per bee. Uh, and if you look at thiamethoxam as a comparison, the LD50 for honeybees is 0 0.005 micrograms per bee. And the LD50 for bumblebees is 0 0.0015. So again, LD50 is not particularly useful for measuring effects at the colony scale, but it is useful for toxicity comparison.
And so if you're looking at seed treatments that should be used instead of neonics, there are obviously some options that are much better uh, in terms of protecting pollinators than the neonics. So the Vermont Beekeepers Association recommends to eliminate the prophylactic use of systemic pesticide treated seed. Uh, last time I spoke with you, I spent a lot of time on the Quebec study that showed basically no economic difference for farmers. Uh, using treated seed versus untreated seed, we're talking neonic treated seed, not fungicide treated seed. And Quebec has very similar soil and climate conditions compared with us. So it's actually an apples to apples comparison. So very little economic benefit, if any at all. So should not be used prophylactically. We're dumping tons and tons of this stuff in places where pest, uh, uh, pollinators can be exposed and we don't need to be doing that. If IPM testing reveals a pest problem, then you should use uh, a coated seed and you should choose the least toxic pesticide for the application, potentially the diamides or potentially something else. And the VBA recommends due to their extreme pollinator toxicity that the nitroguanidine class of neonix should be phased out completely within two to three years. And once again, I'm gonna leave you with this chart, which is the actual uh, pesticide level data from 2022. And I'll point out that uh, 5.3 parts per billion that we saw in uh, clothianidin, that was from up north. And after uh, Dr. Alger from the bee lab saw that, she said, okay, we need to call that beekeeper. So her assistant called that beekeeper and said, you know, we, we test that yard every year for the National Honeybee Survey, and we'd really like to make sure we keep testing that yard because we're seeing some pretty high pesticide levels. So we'd like to, to continue the, the, both the pesticide sampling and the National Honeybee Survey health monitoring there because it'd be relevant. And he said, well, you'd be welcome to, except all the bees are dead. So that's what we're dealing with as beekeepers is going out and in the case of this particular yard, finding out that the entire yard has been wiped out. So uh, that's what I want to leave you with. If it were dairy cows that were dying at these rates, something already would have happened. And I strongly encourage you all to make recommendations to the Department of Ag that follow the VBA's recommendations. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, let's see, does anybody have any questions? Uh, that was a very long, detailed presentation. Appreciate you putting all that time into it. Um, I do have one, just one minor point I want to make. You had mentioned that piperonal botoxide excuse me, hyperonal patoxa was an inert ingredient. It is not an inert ingredient. It is a, uh, it's listed as an active in, uh, it's a synergist. It's listed as an active on it, on uh, pesticide labels, not as an inert ingredient. So that's just a minor point. Yeah, uh, Samantha had that correct on the slide. I, I, I saw it was listed as a synergist and I just said the wrong word. So sorry about that. And thanks for correcting yeah. me, Steve. Yeah, no worries. Um, any other comments or questions? I have a question. You, um, Stephanie Smith of the Agency of Agriculture, of the, um, you had taken samples, this was in the middle of your presentation, but you included plant tissue samples as one of the items that you yes. tested. Uh, what, what, what plants, what, the actual crop plants or adjacent plants or? What plants? So those, those were all field adjacent. We tested from, you know, about three or four feet field adjacent to about 50 feet field adjacent. The plants that we sampled were all plants that were actively blooming and known to be foraged on by honeybees. So we uh, selected dandelions, alfalfa, and goldenrod. And we got the hits in the goldenrod that was field adjacent and uh, we plan to do more plant tissue sampling uh, especially in the spring, but there are numerous other studies that show levels uh, in plant tissue, including at UVM. There was a grad student that was looking at um, 
buffer zones around crop fields for pollinator habitat and discovered actually there were uh, significant levels of neonics in the quote buffer zone. So she thought maybe it wasn't such a good idea to be planting wildflowers there. Uh, and the bee labs come up with uh, samples in some wild bee surveys that they've done. They've come up with significant levels of neonics in milkweed that was field, uh, field adjacent. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, great. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, and we're going to get a copy of that presentation for the record. Uh, Absolutely. I will. Uh, I can send it to you or I can send it to Dave if you like. Uh, Morgan is the. You can send it contact. to me, Andrew. To okay. Thanks. Perfect. All right. And, and we'll be back in touch with, as questions arise, I'm sure. Sounds good. I'm always available and obviously uh, feel strongly about this. So I'm happy to help in any way I can. Yeah, we appreciate you. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Does anybody need to take a break or keep rolling? Okay. Okay. Um, all right, Morgan, you're up. Yep. I'm going to share. Um, so similarly, I might not see you. Um, so just shout to stop me um, if you have questions. But so basically, this is one thing that came up last meeting uh so was to look at the ecological risk assessment of the neonicotinoids that the epa has conducted pretty recently um so i sent out kind of like a narrative summary of those uh risk assessments and then this is just trying to pick and choose a little bit so it's a little bit less detailed than that summary um, but both of those will be available on the website for this meeting, but also on Teams. So basically, the um, the Neonex are going through the re-registration review process right now with EPA. So in 2020, uh, the EPA published the proposed interim decisions, um, which are part of that registration review process. Those are called PIDs for short, P-I-D. Uh, so those PIDs identify the exposures, risks, um, and then any actions that are required to mitigate any of the risks that they find to be um, of concern. So this is kind of a timeline of things that are um, going to be coming out of EPA soon. I did hear in a meeting with EPA last week, so this um, fourth bullet here about an amended uh, proposed interim decision anticipated in early 2023 that uh, will be, they anticipated in the next month or so. So this is just for us to go back to these if we need them. So this summary is from those two um, interim decisions. Um, so they did imidacloprid by itself. And then they did clothianidin and thiamethoxam together uh, because they are such similar chemicals. And then I also looked at, um, also published in 2020 by the EPA is this final B risk assessment that uh, were used as to support that registration review. So again, clothianidin and thiamethoxam were grouped together and imidacloprid was on its own. So there are PIDs for two other neonics, uh, but I'm not going to talk about them today because they weren't listed as seed treatments in Vermont from um, our seed reports. So the EPA reviews kind of the national usage data of these chemicals when they're looking at these PIDs. And so the the largest agricultural use of these three neonics in terms of pounds of active ingredient that have applied um, is in the form of seed treatments. So this is thiamethoxam. So just to kind of give you an idea. So 
of all of the average acres treated with any form of thiamethoxam, 3% of those acres are treated by a soil or foliar application, and then 97% of the acres that have received thiamethoxam do so through seed treatments. Hmm. And it's similar for clothianidin, um, where it's even less, so 1% of those average acres receive a soil or a foliar application, and then 99% of those acres are uh, with clothianidin seed treatments. They didn't have this type of usage data for a middle clofrid. Are you seeing a black box on the screen? Are you? No, we see your, your slide. Okay. Okay, great. So when the EPA is kind of going through this ecological risk summary, they look at just as what Andrew was saying, like, well, how, what potential exposures are there? So <clears throat> these are the terrestrial exposures that the risk assessment associated with neonics. So for birds and mammals, it's mainly the ingestion of the residues that are on the treated seed um, for terrestrial invertebrates. So that's where our pollinators fall into. So it's either contact with the spray, ingestion via the pollen or the nectar, or exposure to the seed dust. Um, there are exposures to surface water and cutation fluid, like Andrew was saying. Um, but with EPA, they kind of prioritize the exposure. So they do look at those things, but it looks like that these were the main routes of exposure. So these are the ones that they called out as being um, the main parts of their models. Uh, so for plants, it's mainly just the exposure is just from ground and foliar applications. So I'm going to focus today, just like um, Andrew did, relevant to treated seeds. So we're not going to talk about the um, foliar or soil applications of neonex that uh, the EPA assessed. So there are exposures are um, basically the highest acute and chronic risks identified for, this is just for terrestrial again right now, um, but those risks really vary depending on seed size and also size of, um, this is for ingestion, right? So the size of the bird or the mammal. So for example, larger seeds like corn and soybean are considered lower risk because they have a lower concentration of active ingredient on them. And they're also too big for the smaller birds or mammals to eat. So all of that exposure is taken into account when they're doing the assessment of whether this risk is um, something that needs to be mitigated. So this is their mammalian risk assessment. So there are potential for acute risks of concern, but the most likely risk of concern in their analysis is from the chronic consumption of treated seeds. So there is some variables that kind of impact how mammals are exposed to the treated seeds. So some of those are how far apart the seeds are in the field and the number of seeds available. Also, the amount of cover the field has. So I guess a a newly planted field has less coverage, so it's less attractive for smaller mammals, right? So it's kind of less, they're more exposed out in that field, whereas a no-till field um, is more attractive to the smaller mammals. Also, a variable is whether or not the seed is incorporated into the soil and at what depth or whether it's on the soil surface. And then the life stage and the size of the mammal was also taken into account for how that exposure led to a risk or not. So for our big three neonics, um, there's slight differences in the mammalian risk assessment, um, but overall the chronic levels of concerns or LOC 
were exceeded for all size classes of mammals consuming select treated seeds, uh, with the exception that for thiamethoxam treated soybeans, they had no chronic level of concern exceedances for mammals. So that means like with their modeling of the risks based on exposure and size and amount of seeds and all those variables that we just talked about, that level of concern uh, wasn't exceeded for thiamethoxam treated soybeans. Um, but in the other neonics, uh, no matter, so some of the other seeds that they assessed are corn, soybean, cotton, wheat, sorghum, sugar beet, lettuce. Um, and so those ones all showed basically a risk for all sizes of mammals consuming those treat, treated seeds. So beyond the mammalian risk assessment, uh, they do a bird risk assessment. They call it the, the risk assessment for birds, reptiles, and terrestrial phase amphibians. Uh, however, birds are used as surrogates for the potential risks for the um, reptiles and the terrestrial phase amphibians. So imidacloprid, imidacloprid is classified as highly toxic to birds. Wolfianidin is kind of going down the scale, moderately toxic. Thiamethoxam is slightly toxic. So looking at the three neonics, um, how they, a way that they kind of quantified that the risk is by showing the percent of a bird's diet, depending on the bird size, that uh, needed to be the treated seed in order to exceed the acute level of concern. So for a midocloprid, you can see that 3% uh, of a bird's diet of field corn um, and that's uh, for large birds only, the birds that are able to eat that size of a seed. 12% um, of the diet for soybean and less percent of the diet for it to be an acute level of concern for the smaller seeds. So for the cotton seed and the sorghum and the wheat seed. Um, however, the uh, EPA does mention that given the availability of other seed sources, so basically the grain of the crop uh, or seeds from nearby weed species, that eating diets uh, made up entirely of a specific seed type is unlikely for birds, um, but it is much more likely an incidence of a treated seed spillage event. So for um, clothianidin, seed treatment exposures, the expected risks are highest for the small birds. Um, and then that risk decreases as you get bigger birds. Um, the large birds, there are some acute dose-based um, species level of concern exceedances when they're feeding on corn, sugar beets, and lettuce. So basically, the acute depends on how much they're eating, but a chronic level of concern is across the board for all three uh, neonics. Uh, so the same uncertainties uh, and variabilities that we that I went over for the mammalian risk assessment. So about um, how much cover is provided in the field, whether the seeds are incorporated in the soil or not. So all of that is the same for the bird risk assessment. Um, but basically the overall uh, kind of definition of that risk can be thought of as the size of the seed and the size of the bird dictates the size of the risk. So, for example, so the EPA calls out to so a large bird foraging in cornfields would have to have approximately 99% of the diet be treated seed in order to reach the acute level of concern. Um, but that chronic uh, 
level of risk is still there. Um, and then EPA does call out that basically because the, such a high percentage needs to be eaten by a bird in in kind of like one sitting or in like in a day, uh, that instance is just highly is more likely if it, the seed is spilled. So for terrestrial invertebrates, so this is our, our pollinators. The, we just heard from Andrew, they're classified as highly toxic to honeybees. The primary routes of exposure to honeybees, we heard from Andrew. Uh, so it's uh, oral ingestion from pollen or nectar. It can also be from surface water, plant cutation fluids, honeydew, soil for any ground nesting bees, um, and leaves. That is, the EPA says that there is a high uncertainty regarding the importance of these other routes of exposure, um, and the EPA lacks information to quantify risks from these other routes. So basically, they only um assess the risk with contact with foliar spray or oral ingestion through contaminated nectar or pollen epa also uh, does not have a method to reliably quantify exposure of bees via the dust from the treated seeds but epa calls out that they're working with different stakeholders to identify best management practices so and they actually reference a lot of the best management practices that we have saved on our team site um and available so those are the stakeholders that they're working with um and to promote technology-based solution to reduce that potential exposure via dust from the treated seeds so they recognize that it's a route of exposure but they don't have a, a method to really quantify that exposure right now So uh, some model results uh, and, and data from multi-year applications in the soil do suggest year-to-year uh, -year accumulation of the neonics in the soils. And, but some of the residue data in pollen and nectar don't show that carryover in the treated, so treated crops. Um, so this is all, these are all quotes from the EPA um, proposed interim decision. So their data is showing that, yes, it's in the soils, but it's not showing that it's taken up by the next year's crop. Um, and so, so this is an example in the midocroplid uh, PID, the residues in succeeding crops. So the white clover was planted after a treated seed, uh, treated corn seed was planted uh, so they were low and so that the risk to honeybee is not expected from a white clover crop that was planted in succession after treated corn. So there is a lot of data thankfully uh, for terrestrial invertebrate risk assessment for pollen and nectar residue for foliar and soil applications for be attractive crops. So, however, the data, I didn't want to go into all of that um, because I really wanted to focus on just this treated seed exposures. So data from exposure from imidacloprid seed treatments um, is not mentioned in the risk to terrestrial invertebrates. Uh, there is a little bit mentioned, you can see here for imidacloprid, of having some uh, weak, the strength of evidence is considered weakest in indicating a colony level risk to honeybees for the registered use of seed treatments on beans. However, that was not for um, soybeans, it was for other beans, so it specifically wasn't soybeans. So. Basically, 
I don't, I can go through these bullet points if you want me to, but so for each of our neonics, there were studies and a lot of these are from that final B risk assessment. Um, that uh, the link is in the few slides earlier. So they found both evidence for, and Andrew did a, a really good job of showing evidence of toxicity to honeybees. And also EPA also called out some full field colony level studies that didn't find effects for hives that were adjacent to treated seed fields versus a control um, untreated, basically, agricultural field. So the risk is there, it is in the evidence. Um, you can see in the clothianidin and the thiamethoxam that uh, B kill, multiple bee kill incidents were associated with the planting of treated corn seed. Um, it was a, a possible exposure from dust drift. Um, and then <clears throat> there were some risks at a colony level, um, but for foliar and soil applications. So I wanted to look a little bit more into the data for each of the neonics. And so this is for the clothianidin. So the majority of the uh, available full field studies evaluated the effects to honeybees from seed treatments of the various crops. So again, these are calling out uh, specific studies that EPA analyzed in order to assess the risk of this chemical. So uh, these are some of the specifics. So honeybee colonies placed in or adjacent to fields planted with either treated corn or treated canola. Uh, there was no significant differences between the treated and the canola control sites for the colony development. Uh, but they also found um, that Colonies located in treated seals had a transient increase in amount of brood compared to the control. Uh, bumblebees, so they also looked at, in addition to honeybee, some studies that looked at bumblebees and wild bees. So that's the last two bullets on this slide. So bumblebee colonies placed adjacent to oilseed rape seeds that were treated with clothianidin had a significant decrease in the mean number of queen and worker bee cocoons per colony. And then for mason bees that were adjacent to clothianidin treated seed fields, uh, the number was reduced. Um, what am I reading? Oh, so you found wild solitary bees per flower was reduced. And then mason bees had a reduced number of brood tubes that were adjacent to treated seeds. So for thiamethoxam, again, there's a multitude of data that EPA looked into for terrestrial invertebrate risk assessment. They, uh, for thiamethoxam, treated oilseed rape seeds they observed increased honeybee mortality. The, um, they tried to look at for this, the fourth bullet down, so the study examining the planting operation of thiamethoxam treated corn seeds is a little bit, kind of was just a, wasn't, a clear conclusion that could be made. So they observed similar mortality in the control hives and the treatment hives the day of planting, uh, but the transient increases in honeybee mortality immediately after sowing in the treatment group. But except for the day of sowing, the control hives had higher mortality in all the other days compared to treatment hives. So I think I, I put that bullet in there mainly just to show reading these risk assessments, it's obviously um, 
my personal t- opinion is it's it's really hard hard to interpret um, and to study and find a clear link, a clear cause and effect just because it's so, so many variables at play here. And I think Andrew touched upon that as well as there's, there's so many things happening um, that it's really hard to nail down A is causing B. Um, but EPA is, is looking at all of these studies and, and trying to put that all into their assessment of, of the risk of these chemicals. So for thiamethoxam, they also looked at bumblebees um, in addition to these honeybee studies. And bumblebees had significant number of workers was reduced for hives, uh, for colonies that were placed adjacent to thiamethoxam or clothianidin treated corn seeds. And they also had worker and drone weights were over 25% reduced for those colony bumblebee colonies that were adjacent to the treated fields. Uh, but then they cite a, another study for bumblebees exposed to flowering rape uh, grown from thiamethoxam treated seed, and they saw no significant effects in the treatment group compared to the control. Um, so I, I think EPA is just trying to throw out all all the available data that was there. Uh, so beyond terrestrial invertebrates, they do also look at aquatic. So this is saltwater invertebrates risk assessment. There aren't many uh, risks of concern here for any of the three neonics that we looked at. But neonics are readily soluble in water, so this was um, a model of potential exposure that EPA looked at. So again, looking further into aquatic risks, so this is for fish and aquatic phase amphibians risk assessment. So the midocloprid risk assessment noted that there is no direct risks of concern for fish. Um, there were a limited number of aquatic incidents reported for a Uh However, they indicate a lack of direct adverse impacts on fish. Uh, there are some, they're classified, so clothianidin and thiamethoxam are classified as practically non-toxic to fish on an acute basis, but both chemicals did show minor effects on fish. Um, when they were chronically exposed. But EPA did not overall um, identify a risk of concern for fish or aquatic phase amphibians. So this is for plants. So this is terrestrial and aquatic plant risk assessment that EPA went through. Uh, basically no toxicity or risk of concern were identified for terrestrial or aquatic plants. For any of the three neonics. So <clears throat> these are the, the final B assessments. Um, look at and the PIDs and the proposed interim decisions. They look at reported incidents for the three chemicals. And so I just tried to summarize, pick out the incidents that were mentioned that were relevant for seed treatment. So for midocloprid, there were 16 incidents reported to the Environmental Information Incident System database from 1995 to 2017 for terrestrial organisms. And there was one incident associated with seed treatment. And that incident um, was a large number of birds dying allegedly due to ingested ingestion of the midocloprid treated wheat seeds. Um, but they did residue analysis so on those birds and it did not detect a midocloprid. So there um, were limited to no incident reports received by the EPA for clothianidin or thiamethoxam. Um, but that doesn't 
necessarily mean that it didn't happen and just that they um, weren't reported to them, obviously. Uh, so they did have one incident involving birds, but they couldn't, other chemicals in addition to neonics were involved. So again, they couldn't narrow it down specifically to uh, either clothianidin or thiamethoxam. So these are kind of more of these, um, just a summary from each of the neonics about those incidents that are reported. These are for specifically for pollinator incidents. And you can see the numbers here that um, they classify the incidents as um, either highly probable or possible, uh, depending on how the data can tie it back to the actual cause of the incidents. So <clears throat> there were some for thiamethoxam. So there were 22 incidents reported in the U.S. for honeybees and associated with agricultural use of thiamethoxam, and seven of those 22 had that highly probable or possible to have been associated with um, corn planting in Indiana, Minnesota, and Illinois. Uh, those incidents included the observations of, of hundreds of thousands of dead bees and um, also bees with behavioral impacts. So as part of the proposed interim decision. So they, after they've gone through the available data and um, identify risks of concern, the EPA then proposes mitigation measures to address those identified risks, right? So um, if you couldn't tell, they've identified the risk to birds and small mammals of eating treated seed. So one of the proposed mitigation measures right now in the PID is to have additional seed bag language. So these kind of three sayings um, are the EPA is proposing to add to the seed bag language. So cover or collect treated seeds spilled during loading and planting in areas um, such as row ends. Dispose of all excess treated seed by burying seed away from bodies of water and also do not contaminate bodies of water when disposing of planting equipment wash water. So I included this last bullet. Uh, EPA does say when they're calling out these mitigation measures that they were considered with the understanding of the high benefits associated with seed treatment uses which through their use have the potential to reduce overall neonicotinoid exposure and offer a lower overall ecological risk compared to foliar uses. Um, so I think EPA is calling out that balance. So that, um, I can pull anything else up if there are questions. But that's kind of like a quick run through. I encourage you to read the um, summary or even just look at the through the links of the of the PIDs themselves or that final B assessment. Um, but I tried to just kind of get it all in. But if there's any questions, I can attempt to answer them. Okay, we have a hand up. <clears throat> yep, go ahead, Clarice. Thanks so much for that, Morgan, and for your work on the summary document. I only skimmed that, but um, obviously a lot of work there. Um, so thanks. I'm trying to uh, remember at the beginning of your presentation, you were saying that this is this is the PID, the proposed interim decision. Mm -hmm. And I think you said that there was going to be an update or maybe it was a different document um, coming out very soon. Is that the the true? decision? It's not the true, and Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but so it's the, basically it's, it's an amended PID 
Okay. That is going to include um, some amendments to the mitigation measures, and it might include some measures that are incorporated based on their risk assessment specific to endangered species. Okay. So I'm going to, let me, if you can bear with me two seconds, I'll pull that timeline back up and, um, right. and Steve, you can probably talk to this better than I can, but so the two, the two, the second and third bullet here. So the biological evaluation, those are specific to the Endangered Species Act. So those are specific to the um, risks associated with neonicotinoids and exposure to listed species. So that's kind of in the middle of this. And so the first, so the first one, so the proposed interim decision was in January 2020. So then that fourth bullet is what you're saying. So that's what I heard last week in a meeting was that they can, they're going to issue an amended proposed interim decision and that's what they anticipated in the next month or two. And that will can have kind of any tweaks to those mitigation measures that we just went over, but also include anything from those biological evaluation so any additional mitigation measures based on those environment um endangered species risk assessments great thanks yeah and i'll just add on there that um so the interim decisions are issued before they've completed the full registration review or the re-registration review, because a lot of times a re-registration review is dependent on data call-ins and data generation that's being done by the registrants, and they may take years to complete. But EPA will issue an interim decision if they've got some, uh, if they can make a change in the use or add a condition that they feel will clearly reduce the risk even while they're waiting for the additional data. And that's usually what they're doing uh, in this kind of situation. And I don't know what the timeline is for the re-registration, but re-registrations can take 15 years to complete. So that's the other thing issue these interim decisions in the meantime. Does that make any sense? Morgan, I have a question. Stephanie. Yep. Trying to pause, make sure the board has the opportunity to ask questions before I ask one. Um, it was mentioned both um, earlier today and then by you that there is persistence of neonicotinoids found in the soil with the planting of treated seeds. Um, and it was meant you mentioned that the a subsequent crop, clover, I guess, is what was planted, um, did not have presence of that pesticide within those. And, and, I, and I might not be saying this accurately. Maybe it's, it's I'm couching it wrong, but wasn't present in the clover crop or it was low maybe. Uh, but I'm wondering, is it, if it's persistent in the soil, is the persistence in the, and I don't know, it may not have said this in these reports, is it effective in, a tr in controlling insects when it's persistent in the soil? So while the plant isn't taking it up, is it actually doing anything in its persistence? <laughs> I sense. get your question. I get your question. I will tell you that the EPA proposing your decision will not answer that question. question. Okay. Um, right. But I th think, and other people can chime in. I was just, I was reminded of Heather Darby's presentation of pest pressures were lower in fields that had been planted continuously with treated seeds, right? Yeah. So like the pest pressure would lower. So maybe that I, if I'm, I think I'm interpreting your question, right? So maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. it is, do, right? So it is doing something yeah. over time by just being in the soil of having, so it, it is controlling those pests by just being in the soil. That's what you're asking, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if that was something that was, because it's, when you'd mentioned like they maybe put other mitigating, you know, recommendations and I wasn't, and 
you said that they don't do this in the review, but it sounds like that could be a mitigating. Right. Yeah. Right. So to have it be. Yeah. I get your connection now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. They didn't, they basically just called that out as a, uh, my interpretation of why they, they were looking at that data was to say, yeah, we know it can be there, but then it didn't, Basically, the risk was low for that subsequent crop, so then we didn't identify that as a risk to, to pollinators to or to right. Okay. Right. Thank right. You. And this is Steve. The, another point is we're going to be collecting soil data right. from Heather Darby's study, so we can get some, we'll get some information from that too. Um, any other questions or comments from the board members or other folks on the participating in the call? Got another hand up. Yeah, go ahead, okay. Claire. Thanks. Uh, this might just be a comment or leading to a question, and I'm speaking in rough draft here, essentially. But um, I guess you know, wanted to comment how far apart the mitigation recommendations were in the PID uh, from the VBA uh, requests. And as someone who's, you know, doesn't work with this data very closely, I guess, you know, Morgan, you pointed out that sentence in the PID um, that is kind of trying to find that balance. And I'm wondering if we're really, you know, if that really is the big difference or if there's like, you know, I think everybody's agreeing that these are toxic to pollinators, but um, maybe there's some uncertainty in the exposure, um, or is it really just balancing the benefits of treated seeds? I was rambling, but. I think, Claire, I think yeah, that's um, why I included, I mean, that is there, like that sentence is there in the EPA risk assessment as like their culminating sentence. Like these, these are the mitigation measures for risks that we've identified. And then that's, that sentence is stated. Okay, got it. But, but I think that's kind of right, the point that we're dealing with here. Yeah. That's the AIB. That's the, that exact point. And um, I think, um, from my perspective, I think we're getting into the meat of the matter right now. <laughs> you know, we're going to be, over the next few meetings, we're really going to be digging into this whole question. And, you know, this is what the, what the legislature intended when they established this and gave us this uh, assignment. Is the, wrestle with this question. So that's what we're here for. So, uh, Clarice, you hit it right on the head, I think. Um, so that's what we're going to be dealing with. And that sort of, and Morgan, that, are you done with that now? So that kind of leads us right to the next, it's almost a perfect segue to the uh, work plan, which is what are we going to think about next or what, what, you know, information is the board going to get next? To keep wrestling with this question, and the big one is the economic impact, you know, the economic benefit of the seed treatments. You know, um, we're going to get some of that information from Heather's study, but the information that the board needs is, you know, that. What what other information can we get on that particular question? Yeah, so we had originally uh, tabled kind of talking through that topic C, so determine the economic impact for crop loss as compared to crop yield when neonic treated seeds are used um, for like planning to talk about it in the May meeting. Um, we Things that we have mentioned, and so it's kind of wheels are working, well, starting to work in the background of of having, so some of the people of the studies that we have, so Elson Shields or Travis Grout, 
um, from Cornell come and give us uh, a talk about this uh, studies that they've done for the economic impact. Um, so that's kind of in the to do list for our um, future meetings here. Um, but if there's other, if we know other people, if we have more studies, we would love to hear from you. Um, we're a, a little light. So the other thing I know actually was called out as an action item uh, last meeting was to reach out for the entomologists. So we need um, to try and have, um, we called out that we wanted to hear more from entomologists like from Penn State or Cornell for the topics, this like the surveillance and monitoring um, and uh, maybe the reduced pest har uh, harborage from conservation tillage. Um, we had called that out. So we don't have anybody scheduled yet um, but if we have specific people that you guys know of, please uh, let me know and I can reach out and we can try and coordinate getting somebody in to talk to us about that. The other uh, thing that we are trying to um, have somebody come in is for <clears throat> a review of what other states are doing. Um, from a regulatory standpoint or just uh, maybe best management standpoint. Um, so we are working on that, um, but we don't have uh, a firm date for that yet either. Um, what we do have lined up is for in our June meeting, um, we have the uh, Pioneer Seed um, Treatments, I think we mentioned so that um, a group of agency of ag folks went with Jonathan Chamberlain and heard a really enlightening um, presentation uh, about basically the logistics of treated seed and um, demand planning and availability. And so we uh, asked them to give that same type of presentation to the board so that it can um, get at that balance. Exactly what Clarice was just bringing up of, of we need to hear um, all of the risks and the toxicity and then kind of look at what, what's available and how, what, what are we, what's at stake, right, for farmers. So the um, kind of logistics of that. So they're coming in June. Um, so I guess for If anybody else is, is there anything else that you guys want? Oh yeah, go ho go ahead, Wendy. Oh, thank you. I was wondering if we're going to have anybody talk about the. Oh, you just muted yourself in the middle Sorry. of your sentence. I was wondering if someone would on economic impact. There'd be somebody who could talk about the economic impact on the loss of pollinators for food crops. Hmm. You know, it's like a little bit of a jump ahead. We're still trying to understand toxicity to the pollinators, but if we're losing them, that will impact food that's pollinated. So will that be part of the conversation? Do you have, do you know of it? Do you have someone in mind or you just, just know the topic? Um, you don't need to know right now, but if you do, <laughs> you can share. I, if you, I have a colleague. Please who has done pollinator studies all over the world and used to work for FAO, Barbara Gilmore-Heron, and I can see if she'd have any interest in doing it. She's got a lot on her plate right now, but I could ask her. I think, I mean, other board members, it's, um, I would love to hear your it, thoughts. Um, Sorry that Dr. Becker had to leave, but does UVM have an economist, an ag economist? Anybody know? Uh, 
I'll, I'll reach out. I know of one that Terry worked with on his, um, but I have a feeling um, I, I believe they're not there anymore. Um, okay, I'll see what I can find out. Um, so in terms of the folks you mentioned, Morgan, from um, uh, Pennsylvania and Cornell, have we reached out to them yet? I have not yet. So uh, yeah, okay. it's on my list. So the entomologists, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, why don't we, for the next meeting, try to arrange that presentations from those folks on the economic on economic impacts um, unless the board members would like some other topic to be focused on but, hmm. what do you guys think that sound reasonable okay. uh see fred putnam has hand up too yeah, just a suggestion, uh, Morgan, um, at at Cornell, Dr. Scott McCart uh, would be a contact person who might have a lead on uh, work that's been done on economic impact from the loss of pollinators on food crops. Can you say that name again? I'm sorry. S Scott McCart, M-C, capital like A-R-T. Yep. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Well, let's. Um, I, it seems like we're a little fuzzy on the agenda for the next meeting, and um, we'll work on it. Um, and maybe we'll, well, we'll just have to get back to you, you know, pretty quick on that one. I mean, there is a possibility that we would not have a meeting on May 22nd if we don't have a good agenda. Um, I mean, I don't know how is that. I mean, May 20, May is going to be pretty busy for some folks, I imagine. Fine if we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a little bit why it ended up, you know, because people were, you know, the pioneer folks were pushing, you know, they were too busy. They were busy, but. Yeah, it's going to be a busy month, I imagine. Um, well, looking further ahead, uh, we're talking about um, trying to organize a field trip to uh, Heather's research in June. Um, and then, you know, hopefully having, um, I don't know, Sarah, any more, you're gonna have any more on risk assessments or? Um, my plan is to have the review finished, I think around fall time. Okay. I haven't focused on it in the past month. Um, so I don't think I'll have, I okay. don't expect to find anything very significant than what I already found. I think I need to formalize the review and write it up. Okay. Okay. Well, so again, looking ahead on the work plan, we're, you know, August and September is when we're going to start having to put things on paper. Um, that's just something to be aware of. So if there, if there are, things or is there or information or topics or presentations that we want to get in the get in before then now's the time to think about them and let us know um so we can you know get them on the table and get them into the record uh before we you know start coming up with some proposals so um all right. Any, any of the board members have any comments along those lines? I personally am very interested in Ontario, that kind of information. We had the gentleman last year about this time, uh, uh, Paul, talk, and I think when he wasn't necessarily getting into the weeds on some of the science and some of the things they'd seen, but, you know, it, I feel like they've sort of been down this route uh -huh. not too many years. You know, they're just ahead of us in this game. and. Uh, to me, I think there'd be interesting as to what Ontario has done, have they found, or? So what was the name? Uh, Paul. It's Paul uh, Hoekstra. Yeah, so Paul Hoekstra, he was with the Green Farmers of Ontario. But, but I would think there'd be somebody, and, and you know, I've been trying to find someone in my contacts to see if they could put us with someone from, uh, I don't know what 
Canadian agency or, or something along that line that could provide some, some information on what they've done, what they've seen from it, what did work, what didn't work. You know, that kind of information I think has is, is got some value, um, you know. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I kind of, Morgan, I don't know if I jumped the gun or not, but we didn't show that video you wanted to show. Yeah, so, so we can. Um, yeah, I was just thinking of that. So that's on another thing. So it was an action item for us to look into a little bit of the um, art Shaftsma. Um, Jonathan, you had mentioned him as be looking into and doing research on uh, dust from planters and uh, mitigation to, of, of that dust. So um, we have a video of a interview with him as almost like a teaser and i know that jill's been working on like a lit review so like kind of what we did before um of a uh, like an annotated bibliography of research that we're finding about um planter modifications to reduced must uh, reduced dust um of treated seed planting so we have a, kind of a, a I think it's a six minute video of an interview with him to also address that topic. So I don't know if, if we need more, um, but or if you guys want to see that now where I can just um, we can post the link and you can watch on your own time. It, it's kind of it's up to you guys, whatever you want to. Why don't we post it and let people watch it because, you know, yeah. if they have any technical difficulties. I don't want to waste a lot of people's time. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, it's an interesting, but that is one thing. So, how about this? Um, why don't we? Um, we'll work on a an agenda for the May twenty second. If we can pull a good one together, we'll let everybody know. If not, we'll 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 defer till June. Um, um, but it sounds like we have some work to do to get that together. Um, is there anything else we need to talk about, Morgan, before we move on to? Um, no, I think we're good. Um, yeah, we'll just work on getting people in and I'll work with Heather about a field trip. Yeah, and, and you know, board members, if you have anything that you feel like the board needs to consider, you know, let Morgan know so we can line it up, okay? Um, and as always, you know, stay in touch with Morgan on, on any questions or anything. Um, so the next item on the agenda would be the review of any relevant 2023 legislative bills. I, you know, that's one of the things that the board is tasked with doing um, to, to, to um, make recommendations to the secretary, but I'm not aware of any that are out there right now. And unless somebody else is. So we can move on to public comments. Can um, you hold on, Steve, one minute. Wendy Sue, do you have your hand up to say say something? Or is that an old hand? It, or is it an old hand? I didn't know. I, th I think she said it's an old hand. Oh, uh, got it. OK. <laughs> That's fine. Sorry to interrupt. OK, so public comments. Anybody in the public would like or attend? Non-board members like to make a comment? Okay. Well, with that, um, I guess thank you very much for another productive meeting. And we'll you'll be hearing from us soon about the May 22nd meeting. All right, thanks. Yep, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Right. First time at this location. Yeah. Where's your office anyway? Um, it's on Cherry Street, like right across from right the LV 